So the next um, panel, we have a couple of these presentation sessions, as Julie introduced earlier. And our ideas here are that, you know, when we started this five years ago, there wasn't a, there wasn't a ton of this sort of research. There was certainly a lot, but not a ton of this research happening. Now, five years later, uh, we're in the wonderful position of having had, you know, so many opportunities to do some more research. Still not enough, but much more opportunity. And so we wanted to have a time to um, allow some of that present, some of that research to um, be shared with everybody here. So we have a couple uh, presentation sessions. This first panel um, is really about collaborative research and the results that come from collaborative research that. Um, are, you know, it, it sounds trite, but really, truly greater than the sum of the parts. And so we've asked uh, Bill Thomas to moderate this session. He will keep everybody on tight timelines and sort of introduce a little bit about what it means to um, go through that process of collaborative research and the results that come from that. Thanks, Heather. Good morning. My name is Bill Thomas, and I'm from NOAA. And for those of you who don't know what NOAA means, it means many things to many people. One is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. But those of you who work with NOAA or work a lot with us know that it can also be no organization at all. <laughs> so, and Dan knows exactly what I'm talking about. Anyway, to introduce our, our panel, it's on collaborative research, and, and uh, you know, we heard a lot about collaboration earlier, but I just want to give a brief definition, um, mine, <laughs> on what collaborative research is. And, and really, it's, it's about research is working towards the common goal of producing new scientific knowledge. And I think what you'll see from this panel is exactly that. So the format we're going to use is about 12, 13 minutes of, of, of speaking with a couple of minutes left for questions. And I will introduce the panel members, and they will introduce themselves. Okay. Say a little bit about yourselves when you get up. So our first one is Karen Cosetto. Karen. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here. And I'm one of the co-managers of the climate change program at the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals out of Northern Arizona University. But I actually work remotely, and I live here in Boulder. So uh, good to see some of the local folks, as well as uh, all of the people from all over the country and our international uh, people who have come as well. And uh, today, uh, I'd like to talk about a project that Julie and I are working on. Um, we're very fortunate to be working with some colleagues at the Yurok Tribe Environmental Program, Joe Hostler and Suzanne Fluharty. And we're also, I, I just found out that we also have a Yurok tribal member here, Elizabeth Azuz. And so uh, really excited to, to, see, to see you, Elizabeth. And she's also, uh, we've had a number of conversations with her, and she's been involved in this whole process. So very, very excited. And uh, Elizabeth, I, I definitely would like to invite you, if you have thoughts or insights during this presentation, please feel free to kind of jump up and share. So uh, as Bill mentioned, the, the theme of the session is collaborative research. And so today we thought that we would talk about traditional ecological knowledge and Western science and how the Yurok are uh, including both of these throughout the entire adaptation planning process and kind of what that interplay looks like. So just a little bit of background about the Yurok tribe. The tribe is located in Northern California on the border with Oregon, and it's the largest tribe in California with 56 enrolled mem or 5,600, excuse me, enrolled members. And uh, as you can see on this map, the, the reservation consists of this one mile swath on either side of uh, the Klamath River, extending from the community of Wetchpec uh, to where the river discharges into the Pacific Ocean. Their ancestral territories, however, extend far beyond. And uh, it's, you can see with that reddish line over there that that kind of demarcates the ancestral territories. And the Yurok have decided that their climate change adaptation plan 
will actually include all of their ancestral territories. And they felt that this was important because they see themselves as stewards of all of their ancestral homelands, not just their reservation. And because they also you know, fish and harvest and gather and hunt uh, in, beyond the reservation boundaries. And uh, this picture on the, on the uh, right is a picture of the Klamath River near Wetchpeck. And th this is a, a quote from one of the tribal members. The, the river is like blood flowing through our veins. And it really speaks to that, like, that intimate connection that the Yurok people have with the river and with their ancestral homelands and with all of the species within it. Uh, so in, in September of 2002, there was a really traumatic event that occurred on the reservation. There was a massive fish kill in which an estimated 34,000 fish, or possibly even double that number, died. Uh, and these were mainly adult Chinook salmon that were returning home to spawn. And uh, this was, uh, caused a lot of um, you know, shock and grief and, and just, uh, and as the uh, elders on the culture committee said, never in our time have we, the elders of the Yurok culture committee, seen such a mass destruction of our salmon resource. And uh, the direct cause of this fish kill were these pathogens, but also implicated in the fish kill were warmer water temperatures and lower flows due to dam regulation. Uh, and the, you know, the warmer water temperatures really stressed the fish out and the, the low flows led to fish crowding, and, and both the warmer temperatures and low flows led to uh, an increased prol proliferation of the disease and a faster spread. And for, for some Yurok who were learning about climate change, and uh, th this was really scary, because what do, you know, what do we expect with climate change? We expect warmer water temperatures, there's earlier snowmelt that's gonna lead to lower summer flows, we expect droughts to be more intense. So this was really a wake-up call and a, a real motivation to start preparing for climate change. And uh, the, the Yurok adaptation planning process can be thought of as occurring in five phases. The first phase is community scoping. Phase two is a vulnerability assessment. Phase three is identifying and prioritizing solutions. Phase four is implementing solutions, and phase five is assessing how we're doing. And both traditional ecological knowledge and Western science uh, play a role in all of these phases. So this, this is a slide uh, that I stole from Joe from one of his presentations, and this is how he defines TEK. He says TEK is often a combination of traditional teachings shared between families and community members through verbal transmission and observations shared over multiple generations on issues of cultural importance, such as subsistence, ceremonial practice, and traditional resource management, among others. And something that Joe really talked with us about also is how TEK is about relationships. And it's how it's about relationships um, of people with one another, about relationships of people with their environment, with the species within the environment, and about relationships among those species. So really about this interconnectedness. So phase one, again, is community scoping. And in this phase, uh, you know, people typically think about you know, what, what's important to us. What are, what are we planning for? And you know, what are our planning areas going to be? And uh, they also think about planning goals. And, and Julie had mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, for those people starting out, you, know, you wonder how do you get started on a plan? So uh, what the URAC did is in 2010, they applied for an EPA environmental justice grant. And they developed a community climate change prioritization plan. And then in 2012, they applied for a, a North Pacific Landscape Conservation Cooperative Grant, uh, and they, uh, that, uh, the, the goal of the, the proposal was, you know, how can TEK inform climate change priorities? So for, for the prioritization plan, what they did was they went to different district meetings and they handed out a short survey 
to kind of get an idea of you know what the community thought priorities should be and and in the uh, in the landscape conservation cooperative grant Joe went out and he interviewed I think it was around 10 elders and these interviews were recorded and they were transcribed and they're this really amazing and rich resource uh, that informed not only phase one but uh, that we've been using throughout the entire planning process there's so much amazing information in these interviews uh, and as as part of uh, you know, part of both of these projects, you know, different priorities came up, like protecting Yurok lifeways and culture, and, you know, concerns about health, and concerns about important food species, both terrestrial and aquatic. And these are some of uh, the aquatic species that the current plan focuses on, including coho and chinook salmon, lamprey eel, sturgeon, seaweed, and shellfish. And this quote, um, which is uh, by one of the respondents of the survey, said, our cultural and spiritual identity must survive. This is imperative. This is who we are. And so, and this, this theme really came across strongly during these prioritization projects. Uh, so, so then in, in 2014, uh, YTEP applied for an EPA Science to Achieve Results grants and I guess one of the lessons learned, which is another thing that people were talking about this morning, is they, you know, they applied for these smaller grants and got them and delivered on these grants. And so then they were able to get this much larger grant that is actually a three-year grant. Uh, and it includes the development of this climate change adaptation plan, but it also includes funds for extending their monitoring network uh, to look more at water quality and quantity and some of the tributaries that aren't, haven't really been monitored uh, throughout the reservation, and also to do shellfish um, monitoring for shellfish toxins. It also includes the development of a local environmental observer network that we'll be talking about a little bit more later. So it's a bigger grant. And uh, for the plan, and, and that's Joe there. Uh, so one of the methods that we used to gather input was workshops, and that's Joe presenting at one of the workshops. We also definitely made use, use of those prior, the prior work that was done. Uh, we had, we, we attended community meetings, including uh, a cultural fire management council meeting uh, that Elizabeth was at. Uh, we had interviews uh, with resource elders and with community members, and the, the resource manager interviews they were both talked about Western science, but a lot of the resource managers are also tribal members and also community members. So there was a lot of rich, um, a lot of rich information that came from those interviews. And the newsletters, they have this amazing record of newsletters that talks about, uh, you know, provides a community perspective on different issues. And with Western science, you, you know, we, we looked at sci the scientific literature, at data, at Yurok scientific reports, you know, government reports, and the like, and so uh, so some of the lessons learned were actually similar to what they found from the community prioritization plan, uh, and uh, and the elder interviews was that there is a really holistic worldview. York have a really holistic worldview, and so sometimes we go to these workshops, and you know even though they were water workshops, people would be like, why aren't why aren't you talking about the tan oaks? Why aren't you talking about the acorns? And or you know why are you only talking about sturgeon? You know what about these other fish? And so, so one lesson that we learned was that we, you know, we really had to frame it, and uh, so that we weren't, you know, and, and emphasize that we weren't trying to create a hierarchy in which one ecosystem was more important than another one, or one species was more important, and that this plan was just one piece of this continual, ongoing process. Uh, so uh, another. Lesson: we, we actually hadn't intended originally to do the, these individual or small group interviews. We were really focused on the workshops, and that was what was written into the proposal. But taking the time to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations or having conversations with groups of people was time that was so incredibly well spent. We learned such a huge amount of information. And, and the workshops are great, but you can have different kinds of conversations with people in different settings, and having the chance to to have those uh, more personal conversations was incredibly valuable. 
And, and the other thing that we learned, and we're also, uh, we're also working with Gila River, and we're kind of learning this too, is we have these workshops, and we invite the community to come to the workshops. However, only kind of a select group of people may come. You know, people may not really know what climate change is, and you know, like, why should we go to this workshop? Uh, people are really busy, and so we're asking them to take a chunk of time out of their busy lives. So actually going to meetings, going to where the community is already gathering was really effective. And uh, like I mentioned, we attended a cultural fire management council meeting. We attended, nat attended a natural resources council meeting, cultural resources. And we got a lot of great input that way. Uh, oh, I, OK. I guess I really under, OK. Uh, did you say one minute? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, then I'll just end with this. So with the vulnerability assessment, um, we, we took this viewpoint that uh, this, this is a, like climate change is just one factor, and there's all these non-climatic factors that interact with climate change to create impacts. And one of the most valuable things for, for this traditional ecological knowledge was it really told us about the climate impacts but it really helped us understand all those non-climatic factors and how everything interacts to, to affect the system. And so that was like a really rich way that we could use traditional ecological knowledge. Um, and it was really important input. So I'll, I'll end there. <laughs> Okay, so um, we're going to hold questions for the, for the end, so you can ask questions of each one of them as they're all done with their presentations. Katie, what is the name of yours? Oh, there it is. Okay, our next speaker is Katie Spellman, University of Alaska Fairbanks. Hello, my name is Katie Spellman. I am the daughter of James Volano and Christine Volano. They are immigrants from New Jersey to Alaska. And uh, they moved to Alaska about 40 years ago, had me there, and um, raised me up as an Alaskan. When I was in kindergarten, a lady named Elena Sparrow she had been working on this project called GLOBE, Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment, um, which is a worldwide citizen science project that's in over 100 countries, 117 countries. And um, I did a little science fair project and submitted it to the science fair, and she said, Katie? you could be a scientist someday. And I thought, hmm. And then my mom said, yeah, you could be a scientist someday. And then, uh, then about two years ago, Elena Sparrow was sitting in my dissertation of defense, and she said, there you go, you're a scientist. Now you have, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. And now you need to act and make change for our community, for Alaska. And she invited me to write a proposal to NASA with her and with Melinda Chase and Bonnie Murray and Kristen, a lot of people here um, listed as our collaborators. She pulled together a team of people who are all interested in making a difference in communities in Alaska, our communities, our families, our, our livelihoods um, to figure out what, we're, what the heck we're going to do and get youth involved in this research, climate change research process. And so um, the kind of collaborations that we have are kind of three layers. The first layer is um, NASA uh, to, to 
live out our charge of thinking of all things as relatives, NASA has um, given us a cooperative agreement and they have asked us to actually play with our brothers and sisters that have also gotten cooperative agreements. So our first level of collaboration is collaborating with all these projects that are trying to use NASA assets for education in our country. Um, the second layer of collaboration is our project collaboration where Elena has, she's our spiritual mother. Um, and she, and scientific mother, and education mother, and she pulled together people from so many diverse perspectives, different nationalities, different cultural backgrounds, and different age ranges. There, the spread, she was a, a grown-up when I was a baby, and now, she, now she's my a mentor. Um, so age and diverse perspectives, and we all want it, we came at this problem thinking like how can we get kids to understand that they can make a difference in their community and that they can help their community adapt to climate change which is dramatically affecting most of the communities and livelihoods in our state. And we sort of gravitated toward this idea of citizen science. Citizen science um, it's a hot term, uh, it's in the dictionary now. It's the idea that s professional scientists cooperate with non-professional scientists to solve a real world problem. And we, we wanted our project, we had this challenge, we wanted it to address local needs of communities because we know climate change operates at multiple scales and those scales can sometimes interact. We also wanted our project to address regional scale um, issues through the use of citizen science. And um, th there's, there's different implications when you think about the different types of citizen science on this spectrum and their implications for changing policy. And you can talk to me later about that if you want. Um, but we knew that GLOBE provided us with this tremendous asset and NASA um, experts and NASA data also provided us with an asset to be able to address local issues that the kids determine themselves in their own communities and also feed into these larger climate change research projects. And so that's the model that we are trying to develop. And so we set out with these really bold objectives and then this first year, this, we're in our first year of the project, uh, we are figuring out how to actually do this. Um, and we have a, a few target audiences. Um, they are educators, that could facilitate a project like this, be their guide on the side to youth in communities around Alaska. And these include um, pre-service and in-service teachers. They include 4-H leaders and other informal science learning centers. And they include community members. And so um, we, instead of saying, we, we got this all figured out, we actually conducted a needs assessment this year to see what these different audiences wanted. Um, out of a project that included citizen science, kids collecting data, climate change research, and, um, and NASA assets. So what did they want? And so we did a, a qualitative analysis of it, essays from some of our experimental projects this year uh, where we were playing around with some ideas and we um, coded their essays to gauge what their interests and their needs were for this sort of, of learning. Um, and here's our sample sizes. We also relied on larger sample size data sets that were either from statewide that have been conducted previously on this topic or um, national surveys or um, intensive interview studies. And what we found, and this is, we're trying to fit all these pieces of the puzzle together, um, was that teachers, they really wanted to engage their students in data collection, citizen science that braided indigenous knowledge and Western thinking, uh, Western science. They wanted their students to have a personal connection to climate change. Even, you know, I was out in Shishmaref working with kids and even some of the kids in Shishmaref, how, you know, it's like, this, is, this affects my mom and dad and this affects my grandma and my, uh, you know, but I'm looking at the two people that I just met from Shishmaref, um, and so we want the kids to have this deep personal sense too that their lives, their futures, even if they're in kindergarten, their futures are going to be affected by a changing climate, and the teachers wanted that too. Um, we, they wanted uh, their students to have a practical experience with real world STEM experiences, that's science, technology, engineering, and math. 
Um, and they wanted their students to be a part of real data collection uh, that not only solved, helped solve their own local issues, but was meaningful at a larger scale in, in cooperation with a university or an agency or something like that. Um, 4-H leaders, they just wanted um, 4-H priorities met and they wanted their, their students doing some sort of environmental research. Um, and that was fun and like a club, you know. Um, and then community leaders and community members, they wanted generational dialogue. And dialogue not only in their own community, but they wanted their youth to know that their community is connected to other communities who are experiencing the same interesting and troubling changes as them. Uh, they wanted the, the, their youth to learn from elders and scientists. They wanted their youth connected and empowered to feel like they had a meaningful role in their community to help solve problems. And they wanted to know um, what their youth could do to help mitigate climate change effects and, and to know how it affects daily life using their own measurements and observations. Um, then we did uh, some work with undergrads too. And the undergrads, they were most in interested in um, networking, career development, and um, seeing new places and getting research experience. They wanted the adventure of it and to be in the field. And so we started to boil all this information down uh, with all these diverse perspectives from our team and came out with this enduring understanding that the big idea of our project would be, and it's that we can make a difference on climate change issues by listening to our elders and to knowledge bearers, inquiring, observing, and then acting. And we had a bunch of other big ideas that we have kind of crafted our program around. And we've ended up with this kind of model that we've been playing, and we're still experimenting, and uh, we've tried some parts of it and tried other parts of it. Um, so it starts with the observations, kids listening to elders and knowledge bearers in their community, scientists about the signs and impacts of change. And then uh, connecting it to their own experiences of change in their community, even if it's on a short time scale. What do they notice changing? What are they interested in? Um, identifying an issue for the community and then brainstorming how they might be able to address that using science. And uh, luckily for us, we have the, the resource of GLOBE, which has a diversity, a buffet of, of approaches and tools for measuring all sorts of changes in the environment. Um, and then, they need to know what their culture teaches about that subject and what their elders know about that subject. And so the Association of Interior Native Educators, which Melinda Chase leads, she's talked to her, answer, Melinda will answer all the questions after this. No. <laughs> um, and, and so they are developing, uh, they're revamping some of their existing clim or, uh, culturally rooted culturally relevant curricula on topics of interest to Alaska Native communities, um, and including a climate change thread into that, um, those, their curricula. Actually, I have a picture of that right there. Um, some examples are their units on salmon and fish, berries, birds, medicinal plants, um, where the kids are, are doing um, pra practicing their culture as well as learning science. Um, and then they collaborate with a scientist. Uh, they talk with a NASA scientist through virtual connections that Bonnie Murray from NASA Langley provides. So she connects scientists working on that issue um, in NASA to kids that are working on that issue in their own communities. And they exchange ideas about, you know, what have you found? What have you found? How, you know, what do you think about this? Um, and so having that virtual connection is pretty neat. And then they um, actually design a project that investigates the issue and then apply that to some sort of adaptation, planning, or stewardship activity that they, the kids devise themselves. And so um, we start by training the educators and community members in a summer course. It's a week-long course um, that goes through the, pro the, uh, the following um, phases asking the, the teachers to reflect on how climate change has affected themselves, how climate change influences the Earth system, so we get the multiple scales um, idea through to teachers. Um, we provide, give them a host of tools that they might be able to use to address climate change issues in their community, um, and then guide them in the process for interviewing elders and bringing elders into the classroom. Um, 
as well as connecting to scientists. There's, you can see Bonnie's face on that screen. If you really squint, you can see Bonnie. Uh, and then what can they actually do about the issue and, and some sort of plan? So I'm going to take you into my living room because Dan said that we got to think about relatives. And I'm going to show you a picture of our relatives because the, the real collaborative effort here is between youth, their communities, their elders, scientists, and each other. And so here's uh, an example that we have uh, done this year. This is Terry. She's a teacher that came to our training this summer. She um, just learned how to ride a four-wheeler, and everybody laughed at her because she was like, Rrr. she's lived in Vien the village of Venatai at the foothill at the base of the Brooks Range in Alaska. Um, it's a village of 200 people. She's lived there for four years, and she really is excited about climate change issues. Um, after attending our training, the, she went back and she said, um, started talking to people, what have you been noticing? And, the, and what have the kids been noticing? And this year was an amazing barrier in pretty much the entire interior of Alaska. It's a crazy barrier. They, the kids were picking berries all the time. They were so interested in berries. And the elder who also teaches Gwich'in language in the school um, said, you know, we can't really uh, depend on berries that much anymore. There's increasing, and she used different words, but in my science words, is increasing uncertainty, increasing variability in the timing and abundance of berry harvest. I wish I had an actual quote from her because <laughs> it was much more elegant than that. Um, but, and uh, Mary Rose had also, she said, you know, we really can't depend on it anymore. And so um, I study the way that phenology um, is changing and how that affects berry uh, availability. And so they called me in, and we, uh, I spent most of my time for several days just playing and going to community um, hangout nights and judging Halloween contests. Uh, then we started thinking about berries. What do we know? You've got to look really, really close when you're studying something. And these are kindergarten, first, and second graders. And they had noticed this themselves, like, why are there so many berries, and what's going to happen, and what if, what if it changes? Um, like Mary Rose said, uh, they studied them, dissected them. And the teacher was really interested in helping the kids think about systems and matching it to the seasonal activity calendar. Uh, that they, so in the summertime, what kind of activities do the kids do? And they draw it. And so she said, I want a circular graph, OK? <laughs> I want a circular graph that shows the relationships between, because Mary Rose, the elder, had also said, you know, freezing, freeze up is happening different now, too. And maybe that is affecting the berries and whether they stay on the plants or not stay on the plants um, for fox and, and um, other uh, birds to eat in the wintertime. And so we made a, a circular graph to match the multiple types of data that she wanted their students to think of and the connections between. We talked to a NASA scientist that studies the way that things freeze up. Um, and they were mostly fascinated by the, the fact that he had seen a penguin. <laughs> we went out and we measured and counted berries. We adopted plants. This rosehip plant was actually named Princess um, Princess SpongeBob or something like that. They, they adopted and tracked their own plants. And that data also um, contributes to a larger scale project looking at the timing of, of berries and ripening. Uh oh, sorry, Bill. I'm almost done showing my family photos. It's like, no, one more. You should look at my cute cat now. Um, and, and what about the ones of my baby when she was, oh, she just learned how to ski. Oh. Um, and then we, we collected data on the atmosphere using the new Globe Observer app, um, which was pretty cool. And then they, they, they were, I was like, so OK, kids, what, what can you do to actually make change in your community? How you, Mary Rose says that you, we need to um, maybe help, help us prepare for uncertain berries. And so the kids had, some of the kids had seen their, their moms or their aunties or their grandmas making jam. And so they like, we could make jam because that, we still have a, a jar from like when I was three in my cabinet. <laughs> and so that, that, for them, that was an adaptation strategy that was real for little kids, that their grandma could still have berries two years from now, even if there wasn't enough this year. And so they made jam and distributed it to the elders in their village so that they could be ready if it was a bad year. And so I guess I just wanted, because William's giving me the hook, um, but I just wanted to, 
uh, think about the power of these sorts of collaborations, especially intergenerational collaborations. This girl named Abby, she, just like me when I was in kindergarten, and Elena Sparrow said, you could be a scientist. Abby was showing me her journal, and she said, Katie, look at this. And I said, Abby, you are ready. You could be a scientist. You can change, make change in your community. Look, you've already done it, and you're only six years old. And I think she believed it. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, mahalo, Katie. You know, it's sort of odd being a moderator when, especially from Hawaii, when we always talk about Hawaiian time, which means you're done when you're done, you're ready when you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody knows what that means, right? <laughs> which, which one is it? Okay, we're adapting at this point. <laughs> uh, our next speaker will be Andrea, Andrea Carmen from the International Indian Treaty Council. Leo Simchani Abo Mawaiyaim, respectful greetings to you, my relatives. Uh, I'm from the Yaki Indian Nation, Executive Director of the International Indian Treaty Council. And also I'd like to greet um, my colleagues and fellow members of the Global Steering Committee of the Indigenous, International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change that works on these issues at the United Nations from all the different regions. And uh, I know you'll be hearing a lot from them. Um, as we go on, I don't want to take their presentations, but um, I would like to lay some groundwork and maybe some principles and show some examples as well of collaborative efforts that we're making from the grassroots to the international level with other indigenous peoples as well as um, UN entities and countries um, and, and many different um, colleagues in this work. Um, it's, it's basically all hands on deck time, I think, as we uh, recognize the prophecies of our peoples about this time and what we're facing, and we also see um, the impacts on the ground. I think we need all of us, and we need to work as a team, as the human family. Uh, we approach this work uh, with a rights-based approach as well as a culturally-based approach, so those are some of the principles I'm going to be laying down. Um, I like this slide because it shows um, two totally different indigenous peoples' um, sacred corn altars at corn conferences that we've had, and the basis of the scientific knowledge, and I say scientific knowledge deliberately, um, of the traditional indigenous peoples on the left, the Diné or Navajo peoples um, in Sele, Arizona, and on the right, um, Zapoteca indigenous peoples from Oaxaca, Mexico, are both based on the significance, the deep and and profound significance of the four sacred colors of the corn. And they both were the same, the same um, of the four colors, which has a lot of representation and meaning in the scientific-based knowledge of indigenous peoples that didn't have a store to go to if a crop failed. That knowledge had to be very, very profound and very specific and very practical as well. Um, in the international arena, I just want to give um, recognition to um, the vision of cultural, spiritual, and traditional leaders who had the vision that we as nations should be sitting uh, with the family of nations, not just to take the violations of our rights, but also to contribute to these discussions that we're contributing to today. And this was when, before there was the United Nations after World War I, there was a League of Nations. And uh, independently of each other, again, 
uh, but with the same vision, a spiritual leader um, from the Maori, and we have a representative of the Maori, Ratnaha, and Chief Daskahe from the Haudenosaunee, the Cayuga, in what's now upstate New York, uh, both went to the League of Nations as treaty nations um, and traditional leaders, knowledge holders, um, to sit down with a family of nations. And I uh, regret to tell you they were not even allowed in the building in Geneva, Switzerland. So you can see we've uh, come a long way. <laughs> not far enough, but we've still come a long way. Um, the International Indian Treaty Council, just a moment um, about IITC. We were the first indigenous organization back in 1977 um, to receive what's called consultative status with the UN Economic and Social Council. And in 2011, um, the only one to be upgraded um, to uh, what's called general consultative status. And a principle that we take into the United Nations that's very important for this discussion today is that indigenous peoples speak for themselves before the world arena. We are the experts about our land, about our rights, about where we want to go, and about what we're seeing on the ground. And we're beginning to see this uh, recognition um, in the world arena as well. These are two of our youth speaking at the UN Expert Mechanism on Rights of Indigenous Peoples a couple years ago. The theme was access to justice for indigenous youth. So of course, we would have a 22-year-old and a 16-year-old addressing um, the UN in, in that forum. Um, just a moment, um, and I, I know I don't have a lot of time, um, but it's very important when we talk about inherent rights that back in um, 1948 when the first uh, UN Human Rights Standard was adopted, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the opening sentence talked about inherent and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. And that, in a nutshell, means that the world community recognizes that no declaration, convention, constitution, or law gives rights or takes them away. Rights are ours because of who we are. Indigenous peoples would say, because the creator gave us those rights and put that, uh, them on our land um, so that we could um, do what we needed to do to take care of that land. And when we had the opportunity to work um, starting in Geneva all the way through the UN General Assembly for the adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was finally uh, adopted um, 10 years ago this year, uh, we were able to talk about what our inherent rights were from the point of view of indigenous peoples. And again, this lays the, the groundwork for this discussion here because it addresses culture, spiritual traditions, histories, and especially rights to lands, territories, and resources. Um, the International Indian Treaty Council began partnering uh, with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization back in um, the late 1990s. And by 2003, we partnered with FAO um, to carry out a consultation of indigenous peoples to find out what the obstacles were to the exercise of our food sovereignty, which is a rights-based and culturally-based approach to our relationship to our traditional subsistence foods. And, uh, we traveled around and we got responses from over uh, indigenous peoples in 29 countries representing over 5,000 people. You can see one of our representatives working with a group of elder and, and young women in one of our Yaqui communities to get responses. Uh, we got them from the Arctic, from Africa, from the Pacific, and we were able to begin um, to compile a collective response um, globally by indigenous peoples. And this is my husband, by the way, standing in front of where the Mexican government is siphoning away um, the little fresh water that we have from our Yaqui communities in northern Mexico. Um, but the very first obstacle to the exercise of food sovereignty for indigenous peoples globally was denial of land and water rights. Environmental contamination was another one. This is Alaska, St. Lawrence Island, military toxics, and of course, the very well-known tar sands um, on the right in, in Alberta, Canada. Another, um, this, this was actually collaborative um, scientific and, and indigenous people study we did looking at the effect of pesticides in our 
um, Yaqui territories, many of which are banned by the United States and exported anyway, under which is legal under international and national law. Um, these are just two of the children that have died as a result. Um, but this is a combination of a scientific presentation and uh, testimony provided by midwives and families showing uh, the impact on the development of children. This is Dr. Elizabeth Guillette, very well-known study, um, showing uh, the developmental impact of children in the highly contaminated pesticide areas. And we took together, and this is an important principle, the test over 80 testimonies from community members, midwives, health workers, uh, along with the scientific studies that were done and took them both to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination as well as other UN bodies. Uh, we're working with FAO, Rotterdam Convention. And together, those two, we were told, the combination of the uh, indigenous community testimony and the scientific studies were um, the result, um, were, were what brought about a result that actually was historic in terms of the recognition of these impacts. So that's another principle on collaboration. But the question was raised, who, owes, who owns the knowledge? Probably indigenous peoples have been studied more than any kind of animal on the planet. Who owns the results? Who controls the dissemination of what comes out? Uh, very important um, principles for you all to think about. Uh, another, uh, another impact, of course, is um, imposed development and denial of free prior informed consent. These are um, fish with tumors um, as a result of the tar sands runoff in Alberta, Canada. And uh, recognition that the chiefs of Alberta, Canada have said that they are calling for a moratorium and yet their consent was um, over, um, overrun by the oil companies and the Canadian government. And a big factor was the loss of language and the mechanisms for transmission of traditional knowledge, very important for you all to think about. How do we keep that internal, Not even before we start talking about sharing outside, how do we keep that internal chain of traditional intergenerational knowledge going when all our kids are in school? They're not being raised by their grandparents anymore and climate change, and of course, um, the UN Rapporteur on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as we all know, have recognized that um, climate change is the single, single biggest um, factor for global food security. Uh, we heard about the impacts of the salmon. This is California salmon, and again, a collaborative research project um, looking at um, a very dire prediction for um, the, the salmon runs in central California because of warming water and salinization of, of the bay as a result of climate change. This is Mexico. Some of our indigenous peoples put um, these areas together. The red are areas that are almost impossible to grow corn anymore because already the impacts of climate change. Um, the rights-based approach that I'm going to lay down here um, comes uh, as a basis is the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And those are some of our traditional leaders coming into the UN for the first time in 1977 and 10 years later when we got that, or 30 years later, sorry, 10 years ago, 30 years later when we finally were able to achieve the adoption of the UN Declaration at the General Assembly. Uh, 30 years of struggle, we had walkouts, we had protests, we had um, um, hunger strikes, um, many, many different factors to bring this about. Uh, it's the minimum standard, so no one in this room should entertain uh, anything lower than the, what's recognized as the minimum standard for the rights of indigenous people. Article three, self-determination. I won't read all of these because I know you all have your bedside copy of the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples at home and you can read each and every one. But I just want to point out the right to self-determination also includes the right to pursue economic, social, and cultural development. Development is not economic development. It's not industrialization. It's economic, social, and cultural development under international law. Lands, territories, and resources, which we have traditionally owned, occupied, otherwise used or acquired. That includes our, our traditional resources, our food resources. 
our spiritual relationship with our traditional um, territories and lands, Article 25, and our right to pass that knowledge on and responsibility to pass that knowledge on to future generations. Subsistence rights, traditional economies, um, berry picking, <laughs> that's an Alaska picture right there. Um, you know, this, these are rights. These are not issues or concerns. These are rights of indigenous peoples. Right to health and traditional interrelated practices. Very important, our medicines, our traditional knowledge about healing and health, our rights that are recognized in the UN Declaration. In the environmental capacity, this is the first uh, human rights declaration that recognizes the right to the capacity, the productive capacity of your traditional lands. And very important when we look at the, the rights that are being violated um, as a result of climate change. Free prior informed consent and development. Standing rock. Let's hear it for Steady Rock. <laughs> This says that before our, our resources are used, they have to have our free, prior, and informed consent, right? And that includes any of our resources, not just lands and waters, but all of them. And also, I have to, as the International Indian Treaty Council, I have to affirm that consent is a treaty right. It didn't get created with the United Nations. This is the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty that applies to Standing Rock. It says that there will be consent. Um, before the entry into that land. So this is federal law, too, as uh, ratified by the United States Senate. Traditional knowledge, and this I just want to highlight a little bit. This is the, the third international corn conference that we just had um, last month in Tecpan, Guatemala. It's the opening ceremony, or after the opening ceremony. Um, but it's really important. This is indigenous peoples have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions, as well as the manifestations of their sciences, technologies, and cultures. Very important, because I think that we need to challenge when we talk about, here's science and here's traditional knowledge. Indigenous people's scientific knowledge is recognized by the United Nations. Let's think about that as we talk these three days. And just to conclude, I know I'm short on time. There's a gentleman standing here who's going to be looking at me in a minute. Um, I think it's really important to recognize the exchange of knowledge among indigenous peoples uh, as well. This is the second international corn conference with the trade of seeds and knowledge. Uh, and especially important because in many of our areas, our seeds that we're used to using um, are now impacted by drought or flooding or, uh, as we mentioned, um, uncertain climate conditions. So we're, seeding, we're seeing the revitalization of our traditional trading routes for seeds. How did corn get from Guatemala and southern Mexico all the way to northern Canada and South America and out to the Pacific, even in Aotearoa, through our traditional pre-colonial trading uh, among ourselves? So we're revitalizing those trading routes. Very important. Um, a lot of tribes are beginning to look. This is the, the adaptation of the buffalo, the restoration of the buffalo, which were destroyed as an act of war in the United States against the Plain tribes. Um, and now we, there are 60 tribes that are part of the Intertribal Buffalo um, Council bringing back the buffalo. But very important, as we were doing preparation for the um, COP21 in Paris, uh, we, we started he hearing uh, from some of those tribes. And do you know that in 2014, there was a freak um, storm in, oh, 2015, sorry, uh, in early, an early snowstorm in South Dakota, and 100,000 cattle died, but not one buffalo, because buffalo can withstand those unpredictable um, climate changes, drought, you know, blizzards, and cows can't. So the tribes are understanding that they actually are mitigating and even preventing um, some impacts of climate change. Buffalo don't tear up the grass like, like cattle do. It holds the moisture, the natural, the natural grassland restoration. 
protecting sacred places also is a form of um, adapting to and even preventing climate change. My brother, who is a scientist, a biologist, um, studied uh, the Thule marshes in California, where a lot of the sacred shell mounds are, and also a lot of source of baskets and other crafts. Um, and he said Thule marshes absorb more than, more than 10 times more carbon than a pine forest, a mature pine forest. So indigenous peoples are realizing that their efforts to protect their cultural and sacred places are also part of climate change teaching our youth um, in Alaska and Arizona about how to work with plants and especially looking at the changing conditions. There are different times that you can gather now and plant. Um, the creation of food sovereignty zones that are free of GMOs, um, pesticides, and extractive industries is another stand that indigenous peoples are making. Um, I don't have time to read this beautiful quote, but this is one of the, the um, Hitali, the, the um, spiritual leaders from the Navajo in the creation of a food sovereignty zone on the Navajo Nation for protection uh, of the traditional seeds, because of course GMOs are a real attack on the ability to adapt um, to climate change with traditional seeds. Um, this is a study that we did, and I know we're talking about studies here. We actually reached 318,000 individuals um, in preparation for Paris in North America alone, US and Canada, and also some from Mexico. And just to say that 94% of the respondents affirmed that climate change was important, and 98% um, said they had seen the effect, and 96% of the respondents affirmed that traditional knowledge could be very important um, in adapting to and mitigating climate change. Uh, this is Paris, um, COP21. You see we had a protest. We had to take to the streets to uh, get the gains that we had. That's the Indigenous Caucus there. And there are some of us who got into the opening plenary. I actually got to hear in one day, speaking live, me and Jenny from um, the Samis were in the room there. She's there, and you'll hear from her um, in a little bit. But um, we got to hear Barack Obama and Vladimir Vladimir Putin, I can barely say it, right? <laughs> Prince Charles and, and a lot of others. And um, we had to fight almost to the death, it seems, but we were able amazingly to get the rights of indigenous peoples recognized in the preamble to the Paris Agreement. <laughs> first time an environmental treaty at the United Nations has ever recognized human rights at all, uh, let alone rights of indigenous peoples. And these are the rights we're talking about here, right? And there are a lot of my colleagues are going to be talking a lot more, but this is the basis for what we're doing now internationally, is a new um, platform for exchange of traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples. But it starts out with saying that um, the states, the countries through this agreement um, will help strengthen the practice of, of indigenous traditional knowledge, as well as talk about ways to exchange. And um, just to, to conclude, um, we, we just had, as I mentioned, um, the third International Indigenous Peoples Corn Conference, about 140 traditional knowledge holders and grassroots practitioners. And I think this is the first and only time that that large of a group of grassroots traditional knowledge holders has responded to this idea of this new uh, traditional knowledge exchange. So I just want to read what they said, because I think it lays the groundwork for what you'll be doing here in the next three days. They're, they're recommending that the new platform for traditional knowledge exchange under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is developed with the full and equal participation of indigenous peoples from all regions, and especially our knowledge holders and traditional food producers in a manner that fully respects our rights, traditional indigenous sciences, and the richness of our ancestral knowledge. Thank you very much. Um, 
just to conclude, we're still not, you know, discontent to talk about mitigation and adaptation. We still have to work hard on the prevention. And this is one of our, our um, leaders who's passed on, Roberta Blackgoat from the Diné or Navajo Nation. And she said, coal is the liver of Mother Earth. It has to stay in the ground so that she can be healthy. Let's remember that as we move forward. Chokwiltesia, thank you very much. Mahalo, Carmen. I also want you to know that I actually have a hard copy of the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, as well as a digital copy on my computer and my iPad and my phone. <laughs> and, and 15 years ago, a group that we formed as a bunch of federal as well as non-federal entities actually adopted that as part of our platform. And is it tattooed on your chest and back? <laughs> I can show you later. <laughs> our, our, our next speaker um, will be Roseanne Lowe. So, good afternoon almost. I'm very pleased to be here. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about a program you've heard earlier when, when Chris was talking about GLOBE. And I wanted to start out with a story because one of my friends had applied for a job at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And uh, she has, she's a colleague of mine and she had given my name as a reference. And, um, and so the person was saying, oh, you know, this is a program, it's a lifelong learning. Uh, elders learn about uh, and stay charged and stay connected with the community. And then after, you know, I gave her a glowing recommendation, she said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm working on an app so that people can uh, protect their uh, communities from mosquitoes. And she said, wow, she says, you know, my elders that are here in, in Hawaii, they were children during World War II, and they remember fondly the times when they got out of school. Every two weeks, they would get out of school for an afternoon, and they would go up and they would round up the mosquitoes and they would destroy the habitats so that the, they, that the island would be disease free. And I thought, wow, what a concept, you know, 70 years ago, this is what people are doing, and this is what we're trying to do again. And so um, without further ado, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this new program we're starting, which is called the Mosquito Habitat Mapper. And unlike the talks that we've just got had from Chris and Andrea and Karen, this is a research collaboration that hasn't happened yet. The app is going to come out in one month. And um, I'm presenting this because um, I understand the importance of mosquito-borne disease um, on our tribal lands. And uh, around the world, more than 17 million people die every year from mosquito-borne disease. And many, many more are debilitated from things like West Nile virus. And so this is a tool that can be employed um, at any level of community that can then um, uh, take a step in, in promoting um, their own health. So we actually, I'm going to see how I can, how do I move this forward? Is it this button here? Yes. So yeah, we actually tested out the app um, with uh, people in, in Brooklyn. And we also work with some um, communities that were in um, um, some parishes in New Orleans. And there was actually some young kids that were involved, as well as elders and adults. And they said, wow, this is better than Pokemon. Because we're going around and we're finding things, but they're, we're finding real things, not just virtual you know, images. And so we decided, well, we should probably have like a little Pokemon kind of image to go with our, our project. So there you go. There's our mosquito larvae Pokemon. Um, and, um, but basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to address the fact that communities around the world, everywhere in the world, are facing mosquito-borne disease issues. And so in, in a time where, where climate change is happening, you wonder why I'm involved in this, because I'm a climate change scientist. Well, it's because of the expanding distribution and the, um, the expanding range of mosquitoes that's happening because of changes in our climate that connect this with the issue that I care the most about. But what we want to do is to give people tools so that they can deal with these hazards and find solutions for themselves. And so that's what we're doing right now. And so it's not available yet, but in one month, we will have the Mosquito app.
and it will reside on the same um, on the same platform as the cl cloud app, if you're familiar with the Globe Cloud app, which has been very popular. We've had more than 50,000 downloads um, in the last uh, few months. Um, it will also be there. And it's a, very, um, it's a very simple process. People who are interested in participating in collecting data about mosquitoes for their community, they can choose to participate at a number of different levels of complexity. And I'm going to just show you quickly what this looks like. So on the left here, the first thing is the app will automatically tell you where you are and what time you're making your collection. The second thing is the app asks you, do you want to take a sample? And if you say, yes, I want to take a sample, then they, it guides you through taking a sample. And then you take your sample and you pour it out on a plate and you see the mosquitoes. And then you're asked if you would like to identify whether or not they might be uh, mosquito um, taxa that are vectors of, of disease for humans. And then you can say yes or no. And then the last step is they ask you, you know, if it is a container habitat. And many of the, the mosquitoes we have today that cause disease, some of the Culex species that carry West Nile, um, the Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus that is responsible for a variety of things like chikungunya and dengue and uh, Zika, um, yellow fever, uh, those mosquitoes um, can be identified directly using this app. So, and then the data all goes uh, back. You, you, the, the citizen science take pictures. The data goes back to a database. There are specialists and entomologists will make sure that the identifications are correct if possible. And then it goes into a cloud um, database where it's then shared and stored and anybody then can query that data. So I think when you're trying to understand what's happening with range expansion of mosquitoes, and you're trying to understand where are these populations, where are we going to have our next outbreak, who needs to be who needs to protect themselves now, who needs to take you know um, steps in the future, you can see why having a global platform like this would be very very important, and this data can be queried then by any um, neighborhood, any community that's interested in the data. And so what I thought I would do really quickly, because I didn't want to take too much time, but I wanted to convince you that this is really useful and easy. I wanted to just show you what the, how the mosquito mapper looks like. And you are some of the first people in the world to see this, because it's not going to be out for another three weeks. But basically, what our app does is we look at a developmental stage of the mosquito that, do, that lives in the water. So we're looking at the larva. And the larvae don't bite, they don't, com they don't communicate disease, so there's no, you're not putting yourself or your grandmother or your child in harm's way by trying to go and find these larvae because they are not the vectors of disease. It's the females that are looking for their blood meal so that they can make their eggs. And those are the adults, and we stay far away from them. And that's one way that our app is different than all the other apps that are now available about mosquitoes because the other ones ask you to take pictures of adults and because NASA is part of the US government, um, that, puts, that, that is seen as putting people in harm's way. Um, and so we don't want to do that. And so that's why we have focused on the, uh, the larva. So the first step is you document the habitat. So the habitat might be something like um, a, a pond or a cistern or a, um, a, a, a septic uh, field or a, a paper cup that was left along the side of the road. Okay, so you document the habitat, you take a picture of that, you upload it in, in the app. The next thing is we ask if you want a sample. So here are some girls, we tested this in Barbuda, in the, in the country of Antigua and Barbuda in the Caribbean, and they're um, taking some samples here um, um, in, a, uh, in a ditch. Uh, here is someone else who's taking some samples. Um, you, can, you can use many different things, whatever's available. You can use a net, you can use a turkey baster, you can use a ladle. It doesn't matter how you take your sample because all you need is a, is, all you need is a, is a, a grab sample to see what's there. We're looking for presence and absence and not numbers. And so then, once you do that, if you look at right here on the right-hand side, has anyone ever here seen a mosquito larvae watch them wiggle in the water? A lot of people have. This is what they look like. They're kind of nondescript, but if you see them up close, they're going to look like that Pokemon that I just showed you, right? And so you take a, we ask people to put, make a sample. You put it in a bottle of water, and then you pour it out on a, on a plate. And then these are the steps, these are the simple steps it takes to identify what your mosquito is. So you pour the water out on a plate. 
you um, you suspend it in a drop of water so that, that it's able to float a little bit so you can see all the different sides. Um, you, you suck a little bit of the water away using the corner of a napkin so it doesn't swim away. And you're able to look at it under your microscope um, attachment. And then you might want to take a, a toothpick and because it has some features you want to see and you can use that to move it around. And then um, this is the most amazing thing is that you know for between Five and ten dollars. You can you can order um, on Amazon or some other source. You can order a macro lens that you can put on a digital camera, and this turns any camera into a microscope. And the the the, the phenomenal um, importance of that I can't can't be I think uh, talked about. You think about all the schools around the world that have never had microscopes, and now if a teacher has a smartphone, they now have a microscope. And these attachments um, give you about 35 power, which is what you need to identify your mosquitoes. And so then you just simply take your phone, you, put the, you clip the lens on there, you line it up so that you have a nice circle, and then you, put the, you, you take the mosquito, put it in the view, and then you focus down, and then you can see, you can see it looks like a Pokemon, doesn't it, right there? There you go. And then, um, and then this is just taking a look up close because you need to see some of the very close characteristic features. So if you're doubting, this is the, the end, this is the end, which is the uh, siphon, which is how the mosquito gets its, gets its oxygen as it's floating on the surface. And um, that's taken with this little $5 device. Um, and you can see all the features you need to determine that this is in fact a Culex um, mosquito. And so then the last step is tip and toss. And especially when we're talking about the 80s Aegypti and the 80s Albopictus. And these are two of the mosquitoes that carry Zika, that carry Dengue, that carry Chikungunya. These are diseases now that are already in the states, um, in um, Florida and in, in, in Louisiana and in Texas. We already have these diseases in Puerto Rico. Uh, we are now finding these diseases um, having a recurrence now in uh, Hawaii. So this is really important. But these mosquitoes are totally adapted to people, you know, over time. And they prefer to live in habitats which are discarded containers of people. So if you have a drink bottle that's beside the road, if you have a piece of trash, if you have a can, if you have a cup, if you have a, you know, um, a tire, uh, that's how the 80s um, elbow pictus actually came from uh, Asia to here as they hitchhiked in tires. Um, but these are all places where mosquitoes mothers love to have their nurseries to raise their young. And so when you find them, we document them and then we dump them out. And if you dump out these larvae on, on the ground, they don't survive, they die. And that keeps the population low. And so every time someone tips or dumps one of these containers, you're actually improving the health of your community. And um, this was a tough thing to convince NASA to do, but we actually, um, because they just like to collect scientific data. And there's nothing scientific about collecting how many things have been tipped and tossed, but we thought that it'd be a really motivational factor for people who are involved in this project. And also then, you know, each community can say, look, we have tipped out 10,000 different places. We had about 10 or 15 per time. That's 150,000 mosquitoes or whatever it is, you know. So I think it's a very important metric. The data can be downloaded by anybody. It comes to the GLOBE database that was talked about earlier by Chris. Um, anybody can access that, that database. And we will also have lots, we already have lots of um, educational materials that we have created to support this, including for very young people and maybe our older people, uh, mosquito bingo games, because we know, I know my grandmother loved bingo. Um, but um, we have all different kinds of materials that can support the education as well as having a little bit of fun with this as a community project. Um, and so um, the most important thing then is just to realize that as uh, Chris has already said, GLOBE is already an international network. And one of the things that um, happened, and I just got back from Geneva, I was at a UN workshop, is that we were invited to come to talk about how important citizen science for mosquitoes is worldwide. And we have just received, um, um, just a couple days ago, the UN has agreed to create a prototype of a worldwide database that would be much larger than the GLOBE database, but include um, data from everywhere, um, and that our, our particular 
app as well as other apps that are found around the world um, will then feed into this database and then we can really begin to, as a group of, of humans on this globe, begin to address you know, things like malaria, which have been one of the biggest problems that we had, humans have had um, throughout the course of history. Mosquitoes have played a huge role in human history. So um, that is all I wanted to say, except that I wanted to say that once again, the last three talks you heard were about research collaborations that are already in progress. They are robust, they're well-developed, they have many partners. And I would like to invite you, if it is appropriate to your community, to partner in this effort to collect mosquito data. And we can work with you so you can make it your own. Um, lots of citizen science projects are such that the scientist decides, hey, we need this data, we need people to collect stuff. And um, this is not that kind of project. Here, we're providing a tool and saying, you know your problem, you know what you want to find out, use the tool in the way that you see fit. And so I look forward to um, inviting you to participate um, with respect to the, um, uh, the, uh, the project in Geneva. It's called Global Mosquito Alert. We came up with the name two days ago. And there is a place for indigenous populations to participate in the process of developing this uh, platform. So I would love to talk to you about that um, at a later date. Um, so thank you very much for your time. It's a little bit different kind of talk, but I'm very excited about the uh, importance of this for, for health and for our communities. And it's also a way that we are registering and, and responding and adapting to the climate change that's affecting us all. Thanks a lot, everybody. Let's give all four of them another round of applause. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I just want to make a comment, Rusans. You know, in Hawaii, we also, when I was a kid, they used to spray DDT. You know, they used to go around in these these trucks, and we'd all run behind them. You know, which could explain some of my quirks. Um, <laughs> but we also joked. You know, when there's a lot of rain, I live in Kaniohe in the windward side. A lot of mosquitoes. We used to joke that it was our state bird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Alaska. Uh, Alaska too. I I heard about that. You know. <laughs> And they don't bite through our shirts, so ours. <laughs> um, okay, so we have a few minutes before the film starts for, for questions that you may have of any of our panelists. Mako Kwa, I saw your hand go first. Julian Heather. The, 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 the question was, will the copies be made available of their presentations? And we have if the presenters, answer. If presenters are willing, they will be on the website. OK. You hear that? If the presenters are willing, it will be on the website. website? Rising Voices website. Um, if folks can use the mics, Mic right that would there. be helpful if anybody has questions. Oh, that mic? Um, I have two questions, one for Karen and one for uh, Ruzan. Um, Ruzan, uh, I just downloaded the Global Observer app, and it, is that the same one that the Mosquito one will be part of, or will it be a separate one? Yes, exactly the same one. Okay. So what you'll see is you can see there right now it says, thank you, uh, right now you see it says clouds, and underneath it's going to say uh, Globe Mosquito. Okay. So stay tuned. I'm told June 25th, I have to take it to uh, Brazil uh, for a test on, December, on June 27th, so it better be done. <laughs> or it'll be awkward. For now, do some yeah, for now, do club observations. Um, there's actually a big campaign on Earth Day. There's uh, hundreds and hundreds of communities that are signed up to simultaneously observe clouds um, because it is the biggest question mark in global climate models. And so um, Earth Day, morning time, year time. Do, now that you got the app, do it. Aimless promotion. 
Uh, and my other question was um, for Karen, um, we only got to phase two of your presentation. How many phases were there? <laughs> okay. Okay. Will your presentation be available? Yeah, uh, we'll have to clear it with our tribal colleagues because we have elder quotes in the presentation and just to make sure it's okay with them to okay. make it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you for the great uh, presentations for, from all the panelists. Uh, firstly, to say uh, uh, from Andrea's presentations, like how really we can use the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to make the Indigenous Peoples' knowledge and the science knowledge uh, together to fight the climate change, and how this one can come back to our peoples, to our communities, to help us to better adapt and protect our land natural resources. That's really very, very important. How all the scientists here in the room can use from the, some of the um, articles that Andrea showed in her presentations to help us as indigenous peoples for other peoples to use the declaration to make it. Um, my question is about uh, the uh, mosquitoes. I'm coming from Africa, so I really know how the mosquitoes are killing people more than HIV and many other sickness. Then I know we have a lot of data in all our Sahelian countries. If we have flood or we have uh, uh, dry, always there is a lot of mosquitoes. Using the app is really a very good and advanced technology, but those uh, apps cannot be useful for our communities because they do not know how to use it. They do not have a smartphone. Uh, how like you can help to go beyond the uh, uh, data, data from the scientists or from the people who went to schools because communities do not know all those uh, uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful, wonderful question. And this is one of the issues that we're, that we're facing as we have these exciting new technologies. And they do have a lot of penetration into um, developing worlds and developing countries. Um, but there are still lots of uh, communities and, and, um, that don't have access to these. And so you know, one of the things is, is happening is that as people take these measurements, it's going to help develop those maps uh, so if a community, for instance, itself is not collecting the data, the data around the community is going to be certainly very, very important and will allow us to uh, allow our uh, local uh, public health officials to make decisions. Um, part of the problem is a lot of these communities don't even have public health officials to make, the, to make decisions to do control. And so um, one of the things that can happen, it, even if the app cannot be used, the materials that we're developing can be used for education, and people can, can learn about tipping and tossing. And you don't actually have to report it in order to make a big difference in your community. And we are working with um, uh, the Smithsonian Institution has a uh, international uh, education program that they're developing um, on Zika. And those materials will be translated into the UN languages, and so those will be available. So I don't have a great answer for you now. I wish we could just give everybody a smartphone and a uh, macro lens clip-on. Uh, but in lieu of that, um, I think that um, things are changing very rapidly. And I think that the price point of the macro lens at $5 is something which is pretty realistic to get at least one in every community maybe in the next few years. Thank Please you. Do. We have time for two quick questions. There's one in the far side. I just want to add okay. something. I think one thing that wasn't talked about is what is the response? And it's very important. For example, DDT is one of the original 12 dirty dozen chemicals, nine of which were pesticides that were prohibited uh, for use by the Stockholm Convention when it went into effect. There have been other chemicals and pesticides added since then. And the Conference of the Parties is coming up um, later this month in Geneva, the eighth Conference of the Parties. However, there are still exceptions for malaria control on the use of DDT and other highly toxic chemicals that, that are known to cause birth defects, reproductive system cancers, um, developmental defects in children, et cetera, et cetera. So I think part of the responsibility of those that are doing mosquito research is also to look at what is the response 
and what is being used in communities, in, including indigenous communities, when they do find these insects, um, and what is the long-term impact that is, you know, well known, but in fact not communicated to communities that are, you know, being sprayed by planes and other kinds of things. So uh, there is um, non-toxic mosquito control. I think um, Vietnam and other countries have developed it, but we need the partnership of the scientific communities, especially those that are looking at mosquitoes to say, okay, what happens when you find them and what is being used in those communities without the full knowledge, especially of indigenous communities on the ground? Thank you. Okay, two so, very quick questions, one over here and then one here. I was curious about the uh, micro lens and the parameters of uh, what, it, what it's, how um, it can focal uh, and also, um, what new types of um, innovations are you guys thinking about to utilize that technology with? And then where do we gain access to get it if we're prepared to be a part of this? Great, I think those are great questions. I think maybe those would be of interest to everybody. So I can just, I'll just tell you really quickly that the macro lens um, is um, about 35 power. And so it has sufficient resolution to be able to do this. We are working with the development of uh, digital recognition software, optical recognition software, so that the um, pictures that are taken by the citizen scientists can be recognized by the machine. And the rest of that, a really great question. I'd love to talk to you over lunch or something. Thank you. Kia ora. My question is for Katie. Um, hello again. Um, I'm Tui Shortland, I'm from Aotearoa and uh, I've been working last year on a program to embed uh, forest cultural health monitoring in our organisation with our year 10 students and uh, we had a lot, I can see a lot of synergies and we'll talk more about that. Uh, but now that we're at the publishing stage of our project, we have been asked by some from the scientific community how robust or how rigorous is our data since it was collected by kids. And um, I think it's the type of attitude uh, in this area. And I was just wondering, do you face that as well? And if so, how do you respond to those attitudes? Yeah, um, I. First, I published my validation study before, so I haven't even written my other studies yet because I had needed to get out that these youth, even five-year-olds, are able to collect accurate data on berries and the timing of uh, the ph phenological events in berry life cycles. So um, I started that way by comparing their data to my data and um, other data sets. So um, if you need help with that, I am so into that. She's so into it. I just wanted to also say that, you know, I think that's a really valid thing. And um, a lot of scientists have questioned, you know, what is the value of citizen science data? And GLOBE for a long time has engaged scientists in the use of the data um, for their own scientific studies as part of that demonstration of validation. And all I can say is when, when GLOBE was invited to the table at the UN to try and solve a problem which is worldwide, and said, your data is important to us. To me, that was, I think, the best validation that we can have. So um, I'd be happy also to talk to you about that later. in the, the knowledge and seed exchange and because um, I work with traditional farmers too. So when we're crossing political boardi borders or we're, we're flying by air, even when I've been given seeds to take home, I'm always concerned that they're going to be confiscated. So I'm wondering how you get around that or how do you protect people to make sure that they won't be confiscated? Um, into the United States is one of the biggest problems. Um, it, see, I mean, you can, we, we have no problem taking seeds to Guatemala, for example. Um, 
There's other places, Aotearoa is very um, picky about seeds, but most of the seed exchange that we do do is in this continent. And we try to really follow the original um, seed trading routes. Um, but I will say that, that um, when, when we had the first uh, International Indigenous Corn Conference, a Maori elder wanted to attend. And I said, well, I've been there. I've seen corn soup, and you eat corn. But I always thought the English brought it there. You know, When they first came, she said, no, we had trading routes with the Americas through Rapa Nui, you know, Easter Island. So I think it's really important to recognize, um, and also salmon. Um, when the Winamamwintu wanted to restore their salmon run that had been destroyed in California by the damming, the closest genetic um, parallel they could find were salmon in Aotearoa in New Zealand. Um, and so we need to look at those original, that's part of our original self-determination and right to development is those trade routes with each other. And some indigenous peoples have been keeping seeds that actually originally came from somewhere else, um, like the Hopi. One example for us was the Hopi that can grow uh, corn with no, basically no source of running water, um, no rivers, no, no, no um, streams, et cetera, no lakes. Um, and this was original seeds from our people, and now they're trading back with us. Another example is one corn farmer. These are original seeds, not GMO seeds, um, that had corn that grew at the first corn conference from planting to maturity in 40 days. Little, small, small corn and small ears. But very important for indigenous peoples that now have very unpredictable growing seasons. So this is one of the most important things that we have done is bring indigenous peoples together to start to reestablish those trade routes, taking it across the border in violation, actually, of Article 36 of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, across borders um, is very challenging, especially into the United States. And frankly, people hide it. Coffee works really well, you know, because they <laughs> like just buy that coffee at the airport in Panama or Mexico, whatever, you know, you, you have to. That's the only thing that you can do. Or, you know, be somewhere where you're trading. Um, we, we find ways, but it is a challenge into the United States in particular. Thank you. Okay, let's thank our panelists again, and thank you, everybody. And certainly encourage all of you to connect with them during our, our breaks, during lunch. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of questions and a lot of great stuff. But thanks again. Thank you, Bill and panelists. Um, we now have the opportunity, just before we break for lunch, to hear very briefly from Ava Hamilton about a very brand new film, um, Protect Our Public Lands. And Ava, did you want to come up and chat about it? And then that film will run uh, as many times as we can fit it in over the course of the break. So feel free to stay in this room, watch the film, circulate through the um, cafeteria so that we're not all standing in line at once. Um, might make the most of your time. Then we'll also show it again during lunch um, tomorrow as well. So you'll have a couple opportunities. If you catch the first half now and the second half later, um, we'll make sure that you see the whole thing. Uh, this documentary was produced by the uh, Paper Rocket uh, production company out of Flagstaff, Arizona. It's a young production, uh, their young producers, uh, Jake, who is Hopi, Dene, and uh, Deidre Peaches. And we took a trip, organized, one of the organizers uh, is here. Uh, she's not here right now. But uh, we took a trip from Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, picked up some uh, activists such as Eloise Brown, uh, stopped off in uh, Norman, Oklahoma, and met up with the, some Shawnees who told us about the um, Thunderbird Lake there in Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, that is the water source, the water supply. And it was a man-made lake uh, built on the burial ground of the Shawnee. And their remains were not moved. And the Shawnee that we met there uh, do not go to that area, nor do they drink the water. But I don't know if anybody else knows that. I didn't know that. 
So we uh, were a three-van caravan uh, traveling uh, to Philadelphia to attend the uh, Protect Our Private, Private uh, Lands Act uh, rally, which was uh, in, yeah, it was in, it was in June or July. I was on the trip, I can't remember. Uh, but it was a very incredible trip because uh, these were very active, knowledgeable, indigenous people from across our land. And um, so this documentary is about that trip. We stopped on the way over, we stopped at the Cahokia Mounds, which um, I didn't know that the Shawnee were also uh, Mound, mound from the mound culture. And we hiked, the rest of us Indians hiked up to the top of the mounds and took pictures like tourists. And uh, the Shawnees wouldn't go up there because they said that they were, uh, there were burial mounds up there. So it was really uh, interesting to me to meet um, these other uh, tribal people and to know, I was very appreciative that they know their history. And um, so then we traveled on to uh, Philadelphia and stayed along the way. We camped out uh, in um, community centers and with people and uh, attended the rally where there was about 10,000 people. And we were able to, we stayed a couple of extra days, some of us did a van load uh, to attend the Democratic National Rally. and. Um, uh, and later I was able to meet, I, when I went up to Standing Rock, uh, some of these Democrats were also there. So the Indian world was really connected this summer. And as you can learn from this uh, documentary, which again, I did not produce. I may be in there, I hope not. I have, <laughs> I might look like me. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's a work in progress, it's not completed and uh, so the producers wanted you to know that uh, it's still, things will be um, corrected, added, deleted, edited out, and uh, I don't know if we're ready to show it now. Are we gonna show it now? This is one of the organizers, Julie. So as we have many artists in the room, you, uh, you, know, you, you know your timelines. We do have a rough cut we showed in Santa Fe a couple weeks ago. They were up all night last night. Um, updating it based on that feedback and it is uploading now it'll be ready in about 10 minutes it's still it's about 30 minutes so we might only play it once today we'll play it twice during lunch tomorrow the purpose here is we want to get feedback before we finalize it um, where's Leah is Leah in the room Christina where's your daughter no okay so Leah who's with us she's 16 year old native Hawaiian um, she is the soundtrack to the film so um, as incentive to listen in and hear her. Um, and so we will play it as soon as Jake sends me the link, which will be in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you. So please please uh, have kind of a critical eye to you and if you're staying to view it at all today or tomorrow, because um, we really would like some feedback. Thanks. So while we're waiting, I'll tell you a so bit more about the we're trip. We're going to break for lunch. What, you're waiting for 10 minutes? No, oh. we're going to break for lunch. Oh, she's always doing this yes. to me. She's always cutting me off. OK. Um, we are going to be back here at 1. Leah, raise your hand. So Leah's the soundtrack that you'll hear in about 10 minutes. Okay. You can go now. Um, so just be back here at 1. Do folks know where the cafeteria is? The cafeteria is just around the corner. The cafeteria is just around the corner. As a reminder, it's cash only. There is an ATM. If you're having any issues, please come see Heather or myself and just be back here at one o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>